is the second lecture on uh, Martinsite, and today we will solve many of the problems that I identified in the previous lecture. Uh, for example, um, I mentioned that the habit plane, which is the interface between the Martinsite and Osner, has very strange crystallographic indices. For example, 3, 10, 15. And even then, it's not exactly 3, 10, 15, but it is an irrational set of indices. And similarly, the orientation relationship that we usually identify between Martinsite and Osner is not exactly Kojimo Sachs or Nishiyama Wasserman, but in fact, there are small angles between the close back planes of the two lattices and the close back directions within those uh, planes. So even the orientation relationship is strange, uh, unlike, uh, for example, slip deformation, where we get slip on close back planes and close back directions. So both the habit plane and the orientation relationship is irrational. And when we observe the shape change when martensite forms, so if I polish a crystal of austenite completely flat and allow it to transform into martensite, then it appears like this. That means there is a plane between the austenite and the martensite, which is completely coherent. Uh, we call this kind of a deformation, an invariant plane strain, leaving a plane undistorted and unrotated between the martensite and austenite. Now, how do we know this? Well, uh, as I said to you, if I take a single crystal of austenite and I polish it completely flat and then allow it to transform into martensite, then this is what we see in an atomic force microscope. So this is austenite here, and this is a plate of martensite, and there's another plate of martensite on this side. This is a scratch, okay? And this scratch is deflected by the formation of the martensite. It looks like a shear deformation, a large shear deformation. But the thing I wanted to notice is that the scratch maintains continuity at the interface. In other words, there is absolutely no displacement within the plane between the martensite and austenite. So on this schematic diagram, the scratch is continuous across this interface, showing us that there is actual complete coherency at the interface between austenite and martensite. Of course, you need more than one scratch to determine that there is no no distortion in the habit plane. I've only illustrated one scratch here, but you could have scratches going in different orientations, and all of them would maintain continuity at the interface. Now, is it possible to transform austenite into martensite by a strain like this, which essentially is a large shear? There's also a volume change normal to this plane, but that is relatively small compared with the shear strain. So is it actually possible to do that when we look at the crystal structures? So here is the crystal structure of austenite. We have an atom of iron at the corners of, these, uh, of this cube and also at the centers of the face of the cube. And people call this face-centered cubic or cubic closed-backed crystal structure. And this is the corresponding structure of martensite where we have atoms at the corners of the cell and an atom at the body center. Now, just looking at these images, it's difficult to see how you can change austenite into martensite, change this structure into this structure by a deformation that is a shear. But supposing I take this uh, austenite unit cell and I draw two of them next to each other. So these are simply two FCC, face-centered cubic unit cells of austenite. I can relabel this as a body-centered tetragonal unit cell of austenite. So we haven't changed anything. We have simply identified a different unit cell within the face-centered cubic unit cell. So both this body-centered tetragonal and face-centered cubic unit cells represent austenite. We have done nothing at all. There's no phase transformation, just a different way of representing the austenite. And when we do that, it becomes easy to see how we could convert this into a body-centered cubic cell 
by compressing along this vertical axis and uniformly expanding along these two axes to obtain our body-centered cubic margin size. And this deformation was identified by Bain back in 1924, and it's known as the Bain strain, a homogeneous deformation which involves uh, a compression along the vertical axis here by the ratio of the lattice parameters and an expansion along the other two axes along here. Now notice that this also implies that there is an orientation relationship between the austenite and the uh, martensite, uh, because uh, if, I, if I show you this slide, you know, we have the 001 alpha parallel to the 001 gamma and the 100 alpha exactly parallel to 1 bar 10 of austenite and this and this. But this is not the observed orientation relationship. It's, it's quite different from this. Uh, there's a, there's a Kojimo Sachs, Nishiyama Wasman type orientations, which don't correspond to this Bain orientation. Now, supposing that we represent the austenite as a sphere, and this is a section of that sphere containing these two directions, then the operation of the Bain strain, which is a compression along this axis and expansion along these two axes, will change that into an ellipsoid, okay, an ellipsoid of revolution about the vertical axis. And if you look in this, you can find two lines here, which remain unchanged in length as a consequence of the compression and expansion along here. But these two lines are rotated. So the original lines OA and OB become OA dashed and OB dashed. And although they are of the same length, they are changed in orientation. That means they're not coherent lines between the two crystals. So the Bain strain is not the shear deformation that I illustrated earlier. It doesn't actually leave any coherency between the austenite and the martensite. So there's something not right, okay? I want to make the interface between the austenite and martensite much more coherent, and the Bain strain leaves nothing coherent. So if I take this ellipsoid and I rotate it around the point O, um, then we might be able to bring one of these lines into coincidence with the other and recover a level of coherency. So I'm going to add a rigid body rotation to the Bain strain to make those two lines uh, come into coincidence. So by adding a rigid body rotation to the Bain strain, I can get a single line that is coherent between the austenite and the martensite. And if you remember from the last lecture, that is the minimum condition to obtain martensitic transformation, that you must have one line in the interface that is completely undistorted and unrotated by the deformation. So the combination of the Bain strain and the rigid body rotation is an invariant line strain. It leaves one line completely undistorted and unrotated. Uh, but notice that this line goes further out of coincidence. So it isn't possible to produce two lines which remain coherent. In other words, it's not possible to find a completely coherent interface between the austenite and the martensite. And that, of course, contradicts what we observed with the shape change, which implied that there is complete continuity across the interface. Okay, So there's still something wrong, although this rigid body rotation plus the Bain strain exactly predicts the observed irrational orientation relationship. So to calculate the expected orientation between Ostnat and Martinside, all you have to do is the Bain strain and a rigid body rotation which brings a coherent line. Okay? And that precisely predicts the irrational orientation relationship that we observe between the austenite and martensite. It's very, very simple calculation.
Of course, we haven't explained the fact that when we observe the deformation, it seems to leave a complete plane unchanged uh, as a consequence of the Bain strain and the rigid rotation. Okay, so we have solved the orientation relationship, but the observed shape deformation is inconsistent with the Bain strain and rigid body rotation, which only leave one line completely coherent. And we haven't solved this problem, that the habit plane is a strange habit plane. So now I'm going to talk to you about one of the most powerful theories in all of metallurgy, where, you know, actually the theory was there first, and then the predictions made by the theory were verified experimentally later when things like transmission electron microscopy became possible. And this, of course, is the uh, theory of Martinside crystallography by Balls and Mackenzie in Australia and Wexler, Lieberman and Reed in uh, Urbana-Champaign in Illinois, who did this work simultaneously, actually, although uh, when you look at their papers at first, they look like different theories. Jack Christian from Oxford showed that they are exactly the same uh, theory. Okay, so imagine that we have a single crystal of austenite here. When it transforms into martensite, its shape will change to something like this because I've sheared it on this plane. Okay, this is the observed shape change but it is actually the wrong crystal structure because we have just proven that austenite cannot transform into martensite by a shear deformation, FCC to BCC. So we have the right shape here, but the wrong crystal structure. And in order to get the right crystal structure, I've got to now shear it on a different plane because a combination of two shears will leave the line common to those shear planes unchanged. Okay, so I add another shear, and you can see that we now have the correct uh, crystal structure of martensite because the combination of this and this gives us an invariant line strain which is growing through this point X. And we demonstrated earlier using the sphere and the ellipse that we can actually get one line completely coherent. But now this is the wrong shape because the observed shape is just one shear. So the that is the problem, essential problem, that the crystallographic theory solves mathematically and quantitatively. Okay, so I'll just summarize that again. Uh, the austenite single crystal, uh, when it transforms to martensite, it changes into this shape. But a shear deformation cannot change FCC to BCC. So this is the wrong crystal structure. To obtain the right crystal structure, I have to add another shear deformation on a different plane. Uh, which will produce the right crystal structure, but the wrong shape. Okay. So how was this solved by Bowles, Mackenzie, Wexler, Lieberman, and Reed? You know, in my time, I have had the pleasure of meeting uh, uh, Bowles and also Lieberman. Uh, so I had the chance to talk to them about this theory of Martinsite, uh, which was actually in 1953, which is the year that I was born. Right, so supposing I take this crystal, which has the right structure, but the wrong shape, and I periodically twin it, okay? So that the macroscopic shape of the martensite is the same as what we observe, but on a microscopic scale, it is periodically twinned, okay? So we recover the right macroscopic shape and the correct crystal structure, and you make the prediction, okay, and this was not known before the theory, that you will end up with twin interfaces inside the Martin site, okay? Uh, okay, and now the second way of changing this shape into the correct shape without changing the crystal structure is, of course, if we periodically slip it. And again, that produces the right crystal structure and the right macroscopic shape, and you're left with slip steps on the surface, very, very small slip steps on the surface. So absolutely everything is solved. We now have the right shape deformation, the right crystal structure, and an explanation of why the habit plane is peculiar. So even if 
these planes are rational planes, you know, for example, closed back planes. The average interface here is no longer a rational interface. It depends on how much of this lattice invariant deformation we add. So what we are picking up when we measure the habit plane is this average plane here or this average plane here. And that average plane is like 3, 10, 15 or 2, 5, 7 approximately. So we've explained perfectly the orientation relationship, the shape change, and the habit plane. Now, I said to you that this is a mathematical theory. So all of these characteristics are mathematically linked. So if you have a particular habit plane that necessarily fixes the shape change and fixes the orientation relationship. So if you have 24 different Martinside plates inside your Osnard grain, you will also have 24 different variants of the orientation relationship and of the shape deformation. How does this look like on a Martinside plate? Well, you know, if it is slipped, we don't see any structure inside there, but we can observe slip steps at the surface if you use high resolution transmission electron microscopy. And if it is twinned, of course, we can pick up these twin interfaces inside the plate of Martinside. And the first verification of the existence of these twins was using a, a carbon replica, which is the method that was used before uh, electron microscopes became sophisticated enough for you to look through a piece of metal. So uh, the next observation was actually on a thin foil of Martinsite made by Shimizu and Nishiyama in um, uh, Japan. And here is a plate of Martinsite showing these transformation twins, okay, periodically twin, very finely spaced. This is 100 nanometers. So the spacing here is of the order of, uh, you know, 10 nanometers. So this periodic twinning is what allows the shape deformation to be like a shear because the strain energy associated with just having a line coherent is too big. So macroscopically, you actually have a plane between the austenite and the martensite, which has a high level of coherency. And absolutely everything about the crystallography of martensite is solved. And of course, I've explained this in terms of uh, face-centered cubic austenite transforming into body-centered cubic uh, ferrite. Uh, you could have body-centered tetragonal uh, and you can even get transformations between completely different crystal structures. So this slide, uh, for example, shows absolutely beautiful image of uh, austenite going to hexagonal martensite, what we call epsilon martensite. Okay? So face-centered cubic going to hexagonal closed-packed martensite. The crystal structure is as hexagonal symmetry. And it's very easy to understand how this transformation happens, because the face-centered cubic and the hexagonal closed pack lattices are very closely related, unlike the face-centered cubic to body-centered cubic uh, lattices. So for example, if we look at the stacking sequence of the closed back planes in austenite, there are, there are one, one, one planes. Okay, so these are all parallel to the one, one, one plane, and they have a stacking sequence a, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, and so on. If you look at the similar stacking of closed back planes in the hexagonal structure, then all that is different is the sequence A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. So it is very easy to see how we can change the stacking sequence A, B, C into A, B, A, B and get our martensitic transformation. So I'm going to illustrate uh, this particular plane now in the next slide. So here we are. Uh, this is a closed back plane of austenite, a 111 plane of austenite. And the next layer here uh, on top would be located with the ad an atom with its center at position B and above it an atom at position C. Okay. And that gives us the ABC stacking. If I move an atom uh, on the next layer from B to B, nothing changes. That's exactly what happens in slip. Okay, when, when you slip a crystal, 
the crystal structure is not changing. Uh, and that's because this displacement here uh, takes you from a symmetry position to another symmetry position, so nothing is, uh, nothing is uh, altered. So that's uh, A by 2, 1, 1, 0 displacement. Okay, that's a lattice vector. So if we translate one layer over the other by that vector, nothing changes. But uh, this displacement here is not a lattice vector. It takes you from a C position to a B position. So if I move along here, then I'm actually changing the stacking sequence. And this is known as a partial displacement because it doesn't restore the symmetry of the stacking sequence. Okay. Uh, so some of you might know that this is a Burgers vector, which is a Shockley partial dislocation. So if you have this A by 6, 2, 1, 1 displacement happening on every second 1, 1, 1 plane, then you generate the ABC, uh, you change from the ABC stacking to the ABAB stacking of hexagonal crystals. And of course, this displacement divided by twice the spacing of the 1, 1, 1 planes gives us the shear associated with the formation of epsilon Martin size. So this is simply the magnitude of this displacement here, and this is simply twice the spacing of the 1, 1, 1 planes. So this is the shear that you predict uh, theoretically when you transform from FCC to hexagonal structure. And of course, uh, the Martin site will form with a habit plane which is exactly 1, 1, 1. It's not irrational <coughs> because the shear deformation is what changes the austenite into hexagonal structure. You don't need any other complication. It's a simple shear, okay? And that's why when you look at the structure, it looks extremely beautiful because in any given austenite grain, you have only four 111 type planes, okay? So this is in an iron manganese alloy, and uh, manganese uh, in large concentrations will favor the formation of epsilon martensite instead of the conventional uh, body-centered cubic martensite. So the crystallographic theory for the FCC to HCP transformation is extremely simple. We start off with a single crystal of austenite, we shear it on this plane, and we get the correct shape, and we get the correct crystal structure, and this plane is precisely 111 uh, austenite. There's absolutely no complications at all with the hexagonal shape. Now, I've described this deformation as a shear, okay? But actually, we know that the density of hexagonal iron is greater than of austenite or ferrite. Okay, so there's a volume expansion when you go from hexagonal close packed to austenite or hexagonal close packed to ferrite. There's a volume expansion. This is the densest form of iron. Okay, and uh, that is why when you look at a phase diagram for iron, and here we are plotting temperature versus uh, pressure uh, for pure iron, as you increase the pressure, epsilon will form from alpha because you know the density of epsilon is greater so when you compress you favor the denser phase and similarly if i uh, at a constant temperature if i compress the austenite uh, hydrostatically compress the austenite it will transform into epsilon martensite in pure iron and uh, you know with the sort of pressures and temperatures that we have in the middle of our earth we expect that there is epsilon iron core right at the center of the earth. And it, it may be a very, very large grained sample of epsilon iron, and I wish we could explore it. The way that, uh, you know, we have some idea of what it is, uh, that its crystal structure is, is you put longitudinal and shear sound waves through the earth and see how they behave when they reach the core. Uh, by either putting nuclear explosions or conventional explosions or monitoring the effects of natural events. So we are fairly confident that at the center of the Earth, there is a large chunk of 
epsilon iron, which is not pure iron, you know, it contains nickel as well. And many, many first principles calculations, you know, where you basically use um, electron theory to predict what should be at the center of the Earth are consistent with the existence of epsilon iron at the center of the Earth. Now, the second way in which you can induce pure iron to transform into epsilon at room temperature is by extremely high stress pulses, because again, that favors the denser phase. So these are uh, experiments done uh, using the diamond anvil, where you put pressure onto, uh, onto ferrite, and you get uh, martensitic transformation uh, from ferrite to epsilon, and uh, when you release the pressure, there is some hysteresis, as you expect with all martensitic transformations, and then it goes back to ferrite. Actually, that's not quite strictly true. You don't expect hysteresis with all martensitic transformations. If it is a perfectly thermoelastic transformation, then it will reverse immediately, but there's no such thing as perfection. So this is a, a transformation between body center cubic and hexagonal closed packed structures. And you can, with this diamond anvil uh, equipment, you can also, of course, monitor the crystal structures. And some, some years ago, uh, we did an experiment uh, with colleagues in the Cavendish Laboratory, where we used Hopkins, Hopkinson bar tests on, uh, on bainite, and we managed to uh, obtain hexagonal iron, but of course it disappears immediately, the pressure pulse is lost, right? Now, what is the importance of the fact that hexagonal iron is more, uh, more dense than any of the uh, austenite or ferrite? Well, that means that a shear deformation is not the only thing that happens when you get epsilon martensite. You must also have a volume expansion normal to the habit plane. And there was an absolutely remarkable experiment that was done in Birmingham University, and it's the only observation of martensite nucleating, okay, which proved that you also get a volume change normal to the one-on-one -on -one plane in when HCP martensite forms from austenite. So here is the experiment. Uh, when you look in a transmission electron microscope uh, to a sample of austenite, and you see features like this, okay? So these are stacking faults, which are inclined to the electron beam. And because uh, the electron beam has intensity oscillating as it goes down the depth of the sample, you see these bright and dark fringes, okay? And the reason why you get any contrast at all is because the local stacking fault uh, local um, stacking sequence of the close back planes in that region has changed from ABC ABC to AB AB okay. in a three layer rich uh, region. Now, if I use imaging conditions which should eliminate this contrast because we are using uh, a diffracted beam that is normal to the displacements then all this contrast should disappear, like, like over here, okay? But notice, you know, what these colleagues in Birmingham saw was there is some residual contrast left, okay? You can see this. This should disappear completely, but it hasn't. And that is related to the volume change that happens normal to that stacking fault. The, because hexagonal iron is more stable than, uh, is more dense than FCC iron. And this is the first ever experiment to prove that the faults that we see are actually thin regions of hexagonal closed back martensite. What they also did was they added alloying elements so that the lattice parameters change. And uh, therefore, the density difference changes and predicted that therefore the contrast, this residual contrast should change accordingly. And of course, it worked perfectly. Okay. So, it's a very, very clever experiment to prove that you don't just have a shear deformation, okay? but you also have a volume expansion. <coughs> Actually, it's a volume contraction normal to the habit plane. 
So I'm going to change the topic now to the thermodynamics of martensite. Uh, because I think that essentially, from a crystallographic point of view, the problem is solved. Yeah? You can always talk about detail, but the essence of the crystallographic theory works extremely well in many different crystal systems. OK, so let's imagine that uh, we are operating at a particular temperature T1. And this is how the free energy of the martensite varies with carbon concentration here. And this is how the free energy of austenite varies with carbon concentration. To find the equilibrium compositions of the ferrite and austenite at this temperature, I draw a common tangent here because that gives equal chemical potentials for iron and carbon in both of these phases. And that, of course, gives us the equilibrium phase boundaries on the iron carbon phase diagram. So this is the boundary between austenite and austenite plus ferrite. And this is the boundary between ferrite and austenite plus ferrite. This is a two phase field here. <coughs> now, one thing you won't find on equilibrium phase diagrams is this point here where austenite and ferrite of exactly the same composition also have the same free energies. So this dot, this is the intersection between these two curves. Austenite and ferrite of the same composition have same free energy. If I now plot the locus of these points as a function of carbon concentration uh, and temperature, I get a curve which is known as the T0 curve. Now, this is an extremely important curve, all right? Uh, because if I have austenite of this composition here, and I try to transform it into martensite of the same composition, I would get an increase in free energy, okay? So in going from here to here without a composition change, I would increase the free energy. So thermodynamically, that is not possible. But on this side, you can get a reduction in free energy, even if the composition doesn't change. Okay, so martensitic transformation is only possible if the carbon concentration of the austenite is on the left of this diagram, but is thermodynamically impossible if the composition is to the right of this red line. <clears throat> of course, if we obtain equilibrium transformation, uh, then the alloy would decompose into a mixture of this and this, and we would get a larger free energy change. But as I explained to you in the last lecture, if you don't have atomic mobility, you cannot get equilibrium transformation. So at low temperatures, it's not possible to get equilibrium transformation. So just to recall, defines the limit beyond which martensitic transformation is not possible thermodynamically, because it would lead to an increase in free energy. And here is the... <coughs> If my average carbon concentration is to the left of this T0 point, then I can get a, a reduction in free energy. Um, sorry, I can get a reduction in free energy here, even if there is no composition change. The comp uh, free energy reduction is greater if I get an equilibrium mixture of ferrite and austenite, but atomic mobility may prevent this from happening. Okay, so. From here to here, we get a lower free energy change, but the composition is not altered. Here to here, we get a greater free energy change, but the composition of the ferrite would be that, and of the austenite that. <clears throat> now, this is thermodynamics, and we are only talking about how the chemistry of the two phases influences the energies, the free energies. But of course, uh, when we have a displacive transformation, we have other terms to consider. For example, uh, the strain energy because of the shape deformation of an elastically accommodated plate. Uh, our, a rough calculation is that it would be about 600 joules per mole, which is huge. So the normal ferrite transformation in most steels happens at uh, something like uh, 10 to 50 joules per mole. So just imagine this is a huge amount of energy that you require to cope with the strain energy. If the martensite forms with twins, then there's an additional energy because of the twin interfaces inside the plate. 
and we have the interface energy between the martensite and the austenite, which is quite small when the plates are large, but is very, very important at the nucleation stage. Now, if the plate of martensite is not perfectly accommodated elastically, then we will also generate dislocations. But it isn't true to say that martensite will have a high dislocation density. That is just wrong. Uh, it only happens in certain cases where the martensite forms at a high temperature, and therefore it cannot, uh, the austenite cannot sustain the large shape deformation, and therefore it relaxes plastically, and those dislocations are absorbed as the martensite plate thickens. But these two terms are not independent. You know, if you relax the shape deformation by plasticity, then this component decreases. Okay. So, uh, it's very important to realize that martensite does not always contain dislocations, otherwise we would never get shape memory martensite. Okay? But if the martensite forms at a high temperature, where the austenite is weak, then it will relax plastically, and as the martensite grows, it will absorb those dislocations. Okay, so um, we have to change the free energy curve that is present in the calfed models to accommodate the stored energy, you know, which if I go back to this slide is of the order of uh, 700 joules per mole. And therefore, the martensite free energy curve is raised by that quantity uh, in your calfed calculation. And therefore, the net reduction in free energy is smaller than would be predicted just by uh, the T0 condition and no change in chemical composition. Now, actually, uh, the free energy required to stimulate martensite is even greater because we haven't accounted for nucleation as yet. But a rough value is that you need about 1,000 joules per mole of driving force before martensite is triggered. So you have to undercool the austenite by to such a temperature that you get about a thousand joules per mole of driving force in the case of the FCC to BCC transformation. <clears throat> okay, so I'm leading you to how to calculate the martensite start temperature. So um, if this is your free energy curve for uh, austenite as a function of temperature, and this is for martensite of exactly the same composition, then the intersection defines the T0 temperature beyond which martensitic transformation is not possible. And as we undercool the austenite, at some point, the difference here will be sufficient to trigger martensite. And I mentioned to you, this is of the order of a thousand joules per mole. Now, why is this important? Well, supposing I give you a piece of iron and I say, look, I want to know the martensite start temperature for iron containing seven weight percent of gold, right? Now, you can do two things. You can go away and do time consuming and expensive experiments, or you can go to CalFed and work out the free energy curves of austenite and ferrite uh, containing 7% of gold, and then see at what point, at what temperature, do you achieve this critical driving force for martensitic transformation? And that gives you a good estimate of the martensite start temperature. Okay? And of course, with CalFed, you can do this for multi-component systems. So you can use your thermodynamic databases to calculate the martensite start temperature for almost arbitrary compositions, assuming that the thermodynamic data are correct. And this brings me to another story. Uh, this method that I've just explained to you works very well for the transformation from austenite to body-centered cubic or body-centered tetragonal martensite. If I go to the FCC to hexagonal transformation, uh, again, we need uh, a driving force before martensite forms. So this is, uh, this is the critical driving force at the martensite start temperature in a series of alloys which transform into HCP martensite. And they are really quite small. Okay. And if I take 
as many data as I can find in the literature on the FCC to HCP transformation. Uh, and work out the driving force available at the Martin size temperature, I get into serious trouble. First of all, these values are just too small, even when they're negative. It has to be negative, all right? Uh, so these are too small to even account for strain energy. And a large number of alloys, you get an estimate of delta G MS, which is thermodynamically impossible, right? It's it says that actually austenite is more stable than epsilon, so you would never get epsilon, but you observe it. <clears throat> now, you could argue that the thermodynamic data are wrong, and to prove that, uh, we did some first principles calculations for alloys and demonstrated that actually you will get a negative free energy change. Right? So the thermodynamic data for epsilon iron for for these alloys uh, and even some of these where we have a very low driving force for transformation simply are not correct and of course it's obvious to understand why you know epsilon has not been uh, 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 a huge area of interest because it was only produced at high pressures but now of course there's a lot of activity because of the high manganese steels uh, and it is an opportune time to look at these data again. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> now there's one other thing that is very, very strange. Okay, um, so I wanted to produce, uh, you know, if we think about body centered cubic structure, we can produce many forms of alpha. Okay, we can produce equiax grains of ferrite, we can produce Weedman satin ferrite, we can produce bainite, we can produce martensite. With HCP iron, I searched and searched and searched, and there is absolutely nothing but martensitic transformation. Okay, never ever has any other form of epsilon iron been observed, for example, equiax grains of epsilon. And if you do a calculation uh, of the phase diagram here, and this, this is for an alloy which is well behaved uh, because manganese uh, is the alloying element, uh, you can predict that you, know, you will get uh, a mixture of austenite and epsilon iron and then epsilon. And this is an equilibrium calculation, all right? Um, so th this obviously is wrong. The epsilon is not suppressed, ferrite is suppressed. So why do we only ever observe martensitic transformation? Well, this is the reason. Okay, we tried many different calculations, but we cannot get epsilon iron to form at high temperatures. Okay, 200 degrees centigrade, it would take, uh, it would take an impossible amount of time to generate an equilibrium mixture of epsilon and austenite. So all the epsilon ion has only been generated by uh, martensitic transformation, whether it is in iron manganese alloys or by explosive deformation or high strain rate deformation or diamond anvil experiments. All of those are low temperature transformation. <clears throat> so this is a challenge to everybody listening. On Earth, epsilon ion has only ever been produced as martensite if you ignore the core of the Earth. Okay? There are no observations whatsoever on reconstructive transformation to epsilon, no equiax grain, and no solid partitioning between the phases. It's an open area for research. <clears throat> so let's see now, how can we use all the information that I've talked about today, which might seem, you know, um, basic science, uh, which is usually not terribly useful, but how can we use all this information in design? Well, you know, with the crystallographic theory, you predict the orientations, you predict the habit planes and um, any deformations. And therefore, how the structure reacts to applied stress is predicted. And therefore, you can predict crystallographic texture. Okay, so supposing I start off with a completely random uh, set of austenite grains, 
which is almost impossible, but this is a theoretical calculation. And I transform it under the influence of a stress, then the martensite will be highly textured, okay? And you can predict this very accurately. You can even predict the volume fractions of the different variants if you take account of the interaction between the stress and the shape deformation. So with displacive transformations, uh, in which you know the transformation product is confined to the grain in which they grow, they don't cross grain boundaries, you can actually calculate the transformation texture and the strength of the different components of the texture. The second very big consequence of displacive transformations, and this is something you have to be very careful about, is because uh, Martin said, plates do not cross the austenite grain boundaries. You know, there's a crystallographic discontinuity there. They leave some vestige of the structure of the austenite grain boundaries. So the prior austenite grain boundaries are undisturbed. Okay? Whereas if you are forming ferrite or perlite, they are not limited by the austenite grain boundaries. And therefore they destroy those austenite grain boundaries completely. So if you have impurities in your material, then they will segregate to these boundaries if you have a martensitic or a displacive transformation structure, because these regions have uh, a low density and therefore impurities like phosphorus love to go to those boundaries. And of course, we are dealing with strong steels when we talk about displacive transformations. So that exaggerates the stress that the embrittled boundaries feel, and you get complete failure. So this is a scanning electron micro showing you, you know, the austenite grains simply coming apart the, at the prior austenite grain boundaries. So this is a phenomenon known as temper embrittlement, where phosphorus goes to the boundaries and embrittles it. And one way of controlling this is to add a small quantity of molybdenum uh, you know, the very rough idea of how molybdenum prevents the phosphorus is that it uh, it gathers the phosphorus, it stops it from going to the boundaries. <clears throat> what else can you do? Well, I gave you in the previous lecture an equation to calculate the elastic strain energy per unit volume. It's a very simple equation uh, where you have the shear modulus, the thickness to length ratio, and the shear strain squared and the dilatation of strain squared. If you balance that elastic energy against, uh, against the chemical driving force, and you assume that martensite is limited by the austenite grain boundaries, then you can calculate the thickness because that's the only term missing in that equation. So you can calculate the size and the shape of the martensite and therefore you get some idea of the mechanical behavior of the structure that you produce. And in general, the finer the structure, the better are the properties of strong steels, right? Uh, and by strong steels, I mean, uh, you know, martensitic steels or bainitic steels, etc. And to be honest, the structure is already incredibly fine because the mean free path is equal to twice the thickness of a plate, and the thickness of a plate is very small to start with, generated by the transformation mechanism itself. To make ferrite fine, you have to go through an enormous amount of thermomechanical processing. With martensite, you just cool it, and you get extremely fine grains of martensite. But we want to make it even finer because these grains are very strong, and therefore their toughness is compromised. How can we make these grains very small? Well, if we were in a class, I would ask you this question. You know, how can we make the martensite even finer than uh, controlled by the scale of an equiex austenite grain? OK, well, there, it's actually much easier than you might imagine. So this is classic thermomechanical processing uh, where, you know, you hot roll the steel and you control the rolling conditions so that uh, when the material leaves the hot rolling line, uh, the austenite grains are not able to recrystallize. So you end up with very pancaked uh, grains of austenite, and you've added some sort of micro-alloying addition 
which prevents those grains from uh, recrystallizing even more. Okay, and uh, then you will get extremely fine austenite grains, and therefore you will get extremely fine martensite. Now, this is a particular steel that we developed, which is fully martensitic, and we wanted to create an austenite grain size, which is about 0 0.4 micrometers in size. You can only do that if you pancake the austenite grains, you know, you squash them, and you add a microalloying addition, which is stable at low temperatures, because, you know, uh, niobium, for example, uh, is when you hot deform at high temperatures, uh, something like 1200, 1100 degrees centigrade. Here, we wanted to get down to 800 degrees centigrade, and niobium would not be any good because it's operating at high temperatures. It precipitates out at high temperatures. So this is a vanadium microalloy steel. And here is the structure. Uh, very, very pancaked grains of austenite. Okay? And you can see lots and lots and lots of shear bands in here. And what I'm going to show you next is a pole figure. The first pole figure here is from austenite, which is undeformed. In other words, it has recrystallized. And these are martensite poles. So they fall into positions you would expect with the orientation relationship. Uh, but if you now, uh, if you now look, uh, so these pole figures are from single crystals uh, of equiaxed uh, austenite inside our structure. Uh, they're not covering a range of orientations of austenite grains. We've focused into one such grain, okay? Equiaxed grain. And uh, the pole figure that you see is exactly what you would expect from the orientation relationship between austenite and martensite if you assume that all 24 possible variants form. If you now focus on a single one of these grains, which has an effective grain size of 0 0.4 micrometers, but you have also huge misorientation gradients inside those regions, you have actually produced thousands and thousands of crystals of martensite inside a single austenite grain. Okay, thousands of crystals. Huge misorientation spread uh, within the martensite. And that's very good for toughness because any cleavage crack would have to deflect frequently in order to progress through the structure. And look at these amazing properties, all right? So this is our, our new alloy. Uh, which has uh, consistently got a, a fracture toughness of 70 uh, megapascal root meters. And these are the previous results we obtained for nanostructured bayonet. <clears throat> uh, this is completely martensitic. And that at a strength level of 2 gigapascals <clears throat> and a Sharpie toughness at minus 40 degrees centigrade, which is in excess of 25 joules, joules which is incredibly impressive, okay? <clears throat> You need both of these, actually, both of these parameters. Uh, although this is an empirical parameter, it's an important quality control measure. And furthermore, you can join this by welding without any difficulties at all in the heat effector zone. So even though it is two gigapascals in strength, we can arc weld it without compromising its structure. So the old story that we tell to students that martensite is very strong, but it's not tough, is only partly true. You can engineer it to get much better properties and obtain directly from the hot rolling mill a structure which gives you fully martensitic, but extremely refined and extremely fragmented. Uh, fra fragmented is the wrong term, but you get thousands of orientations of martensite within a single austenite grain because of the strain gradients present inside the austenite grain. So I will finish there today and uh, I'll be happy again to answer any questions. Yes. Uh, hello, people. And uh, thank you very much, Professor Maresha, for your very impressive and encouraging presentation. My question is the following. Um, um, you know, uh, many times we have to warranty 85% um, uh, as a minimum ductile fracture for, for example, line pipe steel. 
Um, in order to to have a robust design, eh? a very robust design, um, we got followed you know, the same advice to refine a lot the austenite graphite before the the, the transformation on the runner table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So so. Line pipe, you know, is heavily thermomechanically processed exactly for that reason. Okay. 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 But and then, uh, yeah. Uh, just one more comment is that I've only mentioned the elementary properties, which are the toughness, sharpie toughness, elongation, tensile. But in line pipe, there are many other properties that you have to satisfy. For example, how rapidly does a crack propagate when you pressurize and so on. So it's a much more complicated problem than just designing a strong steel, which is tough. Um, so I, I appreciate very much what you're doing. Yes, yes. Uh, sometimes, um, not really sometimes, but uh, our effort is to reduce, for example, the amount of uh, MA, MA particles. Yeah, this is uh, uh, one of the main types. Uh, one of the main targets for us to reduce the amount and the size of MA, MA particle uh, to get a very good toughness. Okay. So uh, that's a very, very good point because uh, the MA particles give you scatter in your measured properties and that is not acceptable for line pipes uh, to a certain extent. You know, you want consistent properties. So um, the reason why you get MA phase is this T0 curve. And if you can send me an email afterwards, I did some work with uh, CBMM. Okay. Uh, and uh, we, we wrote up, you know, how you might okay. control. If you can send me an email, then I will uh, get back to you. Okay, okay. Many okay. thanks for uh, your kind attention. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, well, and just an, another very, very general remark. So you can check that we are at least from three continents, which is quite a lot. So, so yeah, it, it's 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 up to you. It's up to you. So so you 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 can you are there is people from Africa, people from Europe, and and pe people from Southern uh, America. So it, it's it's fantastic that we can speak. This is a very good thing in this period. So I'm very happy about that, and I'm thanking you again because uh, you have been. Uh, uh, addressing so many interests in, in this direct talk, and then you will have also some other in the, your YouTube uh, uh, loaded lessons. So, so it's uh, fantastic. Very good. There's one more question. There's one more Please. Please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Behdesha, for the, the interesting talk. Uh, I would like to ask regarding the uh, segregation. Uh, you mentioned segregation in case of uh, impurities, especially in phosphorus, phosphorus uh, impurity. So, uh, what's your advice? Uh, how how can we avoid uh, forming of uh, segregation uh, during the casting process? Yeah. So that's a very good question. So things like phosphorus uh, are are difficult to remove. Okay, uh, especially when you are mass producing uh, steel. So. An addition of uh, molybdenum, approximately, say, uh, 0.2 weight percent, actually solves the problem. And uh, much of the segregation happens if the sample is cooling uh, slowly at around 600 degrees centigrade. So also increasing the cooling rate there can change, uh, uh, change the sensitivity to embrittlement. But of course, if you are making expensive steels like uh, those used in bearings, then they can use uh, expensive methods to limit the amount of uh, phosphorus because molybdenum, molybdenum has other consequences, for example, increasing hardenability. Uh, and you might regard it as an expensive element. So those are the methods that you can use either to remove the phosphorus or to control its uh, activity by adding other elements like molybdenum. Molybdenum is very effective. So uh, there's uh, quite a, a lot of work done on this by McMahon on which elements and how much they embrittle uh, the austenite grain boundaries. 